Hello, and welcome to the fourth sermon in our series on the Bible and racial justice. One of our goals in doing this series is to grab on to some of the buzzwords that are buzzing around these days as people talk about racism, and then to slow down and take a look at what they mean and reflect on them from a Christian perspective, and specifically from a Lutheran Christian perspective. In the next couple of weeks, we'll talk about phrases like Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter, and then the idea of having privilege and what that means. But for today, we'll focus in on the concept of unconscious bias. I want to start by taking you on an imagination ride. Imagine that you are in your home congregation for a worship service, and this Sunday you've brought a friend along with you. A friend who kind of knows about Christianity, but has never really plugged into a congregation or engaged with the usual topics of the Christian faith. So you sit there with them, excited that they're willing to try something new with you, and ready for them to have lots of questions about what they hear in the service. And your pastor gets to preaching. And this Sunday, she really gets to preaching. She's telling the story about the woman who was caught in adultery, describing with drama how a group of scribes and Pharisees stood this woman up publicly in front of Jesus and challenged him to judge her. All right, Jesus, you claim to be this amazing legal expert. The law says to stone her. What do you say? And Jesus bent down and used his finger to trace patterns in the dirt. And then slowly, he stood up and offered his judgment. Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first one to throw a stone at her. And one by one, the holy men turned and walked away. And Jesus said to the woman, No one is left to condemn you, and I don't condemn you either. Go on your way, and from now on, do not sin again. And your pastor, she is doing a great job today, tying this story into our modern lives, talking about how other people judge us, about our own feelings of guilt, talking about how we all get tangled up in our own sinfulness and the sinfulness of the world, but Jesus comes to untangle us. And she finishes off with another good word from Jesus. Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. But if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Amen, you think to yourself. That was a good sermon. It was the basic gospel message you've known your whole life. But this sermon helped you to think about it a little differently. Helped you to work through some of the things that you're dealing with personally right now. And in the moment of silent reflection after the sermon, you're thinking about how freeing it really is to know that God sees your sinfulness and yet pulls you closer into relationship with God. God doesn't condemn you, but helps you to change. You're thinking about how much you love to hear that old, old story. And then you hear your friend whisper quietly, Psh, I'm not a sinner. This is why everybody thinks the church is so judgy. Now because, one, I am a certified nerd about church teachings, and two, my internal voice can be kind of snarky before it goes through the filter, my immediate internal response to that friend would probably be something like, oh honey, you're missing the whole point. And here's a pop quiz for all of you cradle Lutherans out there. What is the point of all of the church's talk about sin? The point is that all people, all of us, are sinners. Even folks who are good people and who try their best. We all have harmful habits. We all give in to temptation sometimes. We are all caught in sinful situations just by virtue of being alive in this world. But God is surprisingly understanding about all of that, especially when we compare God to human beings and how much we judge each other. God is wildly merciful. God takes out a machete and cuts a path to forgiveness for us. 
God helps us to change for the better. So when we're talking about the gospel, we start with that uncomfortable reminder that we are all sinners. But that starting point eventually leads us to a message that is both honest and compassionate, and also helpful and empowering. Responding to that message with, I'm not a sinner, that just cuts off all of the goodness of the message before it can get in. It's a defense triggered by the uncomfortable part that blocks all the forgiveness and all of the hope that comes after. That's why it misses the point. When racism comes up in a conversation and someone says, but I'm not a racist, I have the same reaction. You're missing the point. Recognizing the uncomfortable truth of the sin in us individually and in the world and the way that it moves and works, that is the first step towards the good news that God gives us grace and God gives us the power to change. In the same way, recognizing the uncomfortable truth of the racism in us and in the world is the first step towards the good news that we can do something about that racism. The stories of people of color prove that racism is still a powerful force in our country today, despite all of the successes of the civil rights movement and despite all of the laws that exist that try to stop racism, still racism pervades. I know first and secondhand stories of black people being stopped on the streets and questioned in their own neighborhoods, asked why they are there. I know stories of homes being appraised for $100,000 less, depending on the skin color of the people in the family photos on the wall. I know stories of black men being followed around in stores so that people can make sure they're not there to steal anything. When stories like these are gathered into statistics, that truth hits us in another way. For instance, according to the U.S. Department of Justice, in both 2017 and 2018, the number of hate crimes motivated by race was far bigger than the number of hate crimes for other reasons. Hands down, no contest, not even close. The number of race-based hate crimes was larger than all the other categories of hate crimes combined. Living in a society with such strong racist patterns, we really can't help but soak up some of those racist ideas ourselves. Even if our parents taught us to treat all people equally, even if we really do our best to love everyone, we can't totally avoid racism because it's in the air that we breathe every single day. This is true even for people of color. And one of the most heartbreaking forms it can take is as internalized racism, where people of color live with a sense that they are inferior, because that's what society has taught them since they were tiny. The fact that we soak up biases from our culture and then carry them around inside of us, even when we really do believe with all of our hearts that all people are equal, that's what unconscious bias refers to. We are exposed to racist ideas so often that they take root in our minds. And sometimes, despite our best intentions, we act out of those biases. One common unconscious bias among us white Christians is that we tend to associate people of color with unchurched people. Even though we know that's not true, and even though we would never say that, it sort of hangs out in the background. And sometimes that assumption slips out, even when we are doing our best to be kind. Like this Christian woman on a plane, who was so excited to hear that the Ethiopian man sitting next to her was a pastor. And when did the gospel come to your people? She asked joyfully. The pastor replied, the first century, madam then gently explained to her that there have been churches in Ethiopia since the very beginning of the church, 
And the book of Acts even tells us the story of an Ethiopian man coming to be baptized. Another example of unconscious bias is a fairly recent story from a white ELCA congregation. A church member came to worship, picked up the bulletin, and saw on the cover a picture of a little black girl and a little white boy holding hands. And he threw it on the ground, yelling that it was unacceptable. Now that was a conscious bias. The unconscious bias was in the people all around him who did not say a word about his behavior. They have the unconscious bias that many of us has, have, that when someone says something that's racist, we shouldn't say anything because it might make other people uncomfortable. It's not worth it. It's better to just not stir up that conflict and keep the peace. But imagine if that man had instead bonked his knee on the pew and yelled the F word really loud in the middle of the organ prelude. I imagine that if he dropped the F bomb, at least one sweet church lady would have said something, or maybe a mom would have gasped and covered her children's ears. But even though F bombs don't usually cause real harm, Whereas bigotry feeds a system that hurts people emotionally, financially, physically, mentally, every single day, I tend to hear more Christians speaking up about swear words than I do about racism. That's an unconscious bias that many of us have. A bias about which problems are worth addressing, even when it's uncomfortable. Other examples of unconscious bias might include being afraid to ask a black man for directions, or being surprised when a person of color speaks so articulately, or thinking that a person with an accent is less smart, or distrusting people of color when they share their stories of racism. But like I said earlier, Recognizing our own unconscious biases is important, not because we ought to be wallowing in guilt, but because it's the first step towards making things better. Recognizing our unconscious biases is important because it's the necessary work to move towards healing and changing the world. Only when we realize that we have these unconscious biases can we start undoing them. And here's the part I think is really exciting. Our Christian tradition gives us so many gifts to offer in the work of recognizing and undoing unconscious biases. We are equipped to be leaders in this work at a time when our society so needs help. And here's why I think that. What does it take to recognize and undo unconscious biases? It takes humility and vulnerability to be able to set down our defenses and really take a look inside of ourselves and see the bad stuff that's going on in there. It takes a sense of conviction that that stuff is wrong in the first place. It takes a desire to change it. And then that humility comes back again to open us up to learning to be different. Humility, vulnerability, self-reflection, recognition of wrong, desire to change, openness to learning and to living differently. What does that sound like? It sounds like repentance. And for Christians, the process to repentance is central to our faith. It's something we've been taught, it's something we've practiced, and we have even tra trained in repenting of unknown or unconscious sins. Repenting of unknown sins is in the Bible. In fact, according to Old Testament laws, sin offerings were basically for unintentional sins. And the whole community was even told to make sacrifices for unintentional sin. In the New Testament, we see that familiar struggle between our good intentions and our commitment to God's will versus our own habits and temptations. We see that struggle depicted in the words of Paul. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate, Paul said. Traditional Lutheran worship services begin with self-reflection, confession, and repentance. 
And sometimes those confessions also give us the opportunity to admit that we have done wrong things without realizing it. In the words of one of the confessions from our hymnal, in your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. So as Christians, we already know the importance of recognizing wrongs, of asking for forgiveness, of asking for help from God and other people to help us change ourselves. We have thousands of years of traditions and tools and teachings to help us recognize our own unconscious biases and to share with others in the same struggle. We have a lot to offer, and we need to start with ourselves. And we Lutheran Christians have a teaching that could be super helpful here. There's this weird but very common logic that goes like this. He can't be a racist. He's a good person. But we know that you can be a good person in just about every way and still have unconscious biases or still commit really blatant sins. In fact, we Lutherans say that all Christians are simultaneously saints and sinners. Luther wrote that many folks in his time, including himself, were trying so desperately to become righteous that it was driving them to despair. But, he wrote, we teach and comfort an afflicted sinner in this way. Brother, it is impossible for you to become righteous in this life, so righteous that your body is as clear and spotless as the sun. You still have spots and wrinkles, and yet you are holy. But you say, how can I be holy when I have sin and am aware of it? That you feel and acknowledge sin, this is good. Thank God and do not despair. It is one step toward health when a sick man admits and confesses his disease. But how will I be liberated from sin? Run to Christ, the physician, who heals the contrite of heart and saves sinners. Believe in him. If you believe, you are righteous, because you attribute to God the glory of being almighty, merciful, truthful, and the sin that still remains is you in you is not imputed, but is forgiven for the sake of Christ, in whom you believe and who is perfectly righteous. His righteousness is yours. Your sin is his, Luther wrote. We are simultaneously saints, and sinners. At the same time, we are people who do wrong and people who are made right by God as we admit our sin and trust God to forgive us through Jesus Christ. We can simultaneously have unconscious biases and work for racial justice as we recognize those biases and make them part of our work. So let's do the humble work of self-reflection, of seeking out our own unconscious biases. And when we find them, let's hand them over first to the forgiving and transforming power of God. And then let's offer them up as part of our commitment to work to build a better world for all people. The work that must start within ourselves. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God of all mercy and consolation, Come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved in the name of Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven. 
Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen.